Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, I'm James Harding. I'm the uh, editor and co-founder of Tortoise and welcome to this, our Tuesday lunchtime, thinking our weekly open news meeting. Um, back in the day, we used to meet in our offices in central London and in effect leave the doors open. Um, we're happy that in the world we find ourselves in, it's easier to fling those doors open. It means that uh, people can come in from all around the country, all around the world. And what we try to do in this hour is talk about things we're working on, some of the ideas or news leads that we've seen and think there may be a story there, there may be a subject that warrants a tortoise take, a tortoise point of view. But if we take our open journalism seriously, it means that that point of view, that possible storyline, should be informed by what you think. And so I hope uh, the regulars at our thinkings will forgive me just for saying it really, really matters to us that you weigh in. Um, my colleague Liz Mosley is um, uh, marshalling the chat. There she is, the mighty Liz. Um, hello there. And, um, and we hope that you'll just you know, weave in things that you think we should think about, and I'll probably try and bring them into the conversation. Um, also, you'll know you can just put your digital hand up, that little blue digital hand up, if you press the participants tab. Um, and please feel free to treat this as informally as possible. We made that rule that says there are no, there are no questions at Thinkins. We want to hear what you think, so that people weren't too deferential. People really did uh, weigh in. And we've, as I hope you've seen in the last few weeks, added another innovation in that spirit of openness, which is we have our news list. We have a run of things that are uh, on our uh, on our minds. It's, it's in the app or on the website. Um, and it's an attempt to say, OK, well, what are the what are the stories or what are the leads that we think are worth following? I'm going to I'm going to start actually at the top today. Um, because it was Giles would tell my colleague and fellow editor Tortoise who flagged up the speech that Michael Gove, um, who runs the cabinet office in the UK government, and has been in many ways one of those uh, very few people whose government history runs right through the decade, through the Cameron and Clegg years, through Theresa May, through Boris Johnson. And he gave this speech uh, that Charles flagged up to me, um, which was ostensibly about uh, the role of the civil service and the need for a fundamental reform and rethink of um, uh, government, particularly around experimentation and measurement. But it was, it was cloaked or it was shaped around a vision for something that was a very, very different government from the one that in some ways was elected uh, at the end of last year, certainly inciting as its lodestar um, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so I just wanted to start there, Giles, just what you thought of the Gove speech and what that might mean, where that possibly takes us. In, I know you touched on it in the sense maker this morning, mm. yesterday morning, Chris did yet this morning. What, what, what did you think is the, is the significance of it? Well, I was reminded, first of all, of a sofa, a particular blue sofa uh, in the Times building, three Times buildings ago, uh, behind Michael Gove's desk when he was a Times leader writer. I, I was as well, and I used to have a snooze on that sofa from time to time. Uh, there haven't been any sofas in subsequent uh, Times buildings, as far as I'm aware, which is a, a regret. But this, this was, in a sense, an extended Times leader with, uh, I, I say was, I should say is, um, it's out there, it's, it's worth a read. There's all these, um, it starts with a mention of Gramsci, the, the Italian socialist, it goes on as you say, to invoke FDR. And in a sense, it's just a lot of very clever packaging for two uh, policy goals, um, which are, dear to Gove's heart. Uh, let's go back to granular measurement of civil service performance and let's uh, feel free to, to distribute a lot of government functions elsewhere than in London. I think both perfectly valid aims dressed up in Govian leader writers uh, language and um, 
that, so far, as you can tell, is a sort of reductive assessment. And uh, Nicholas Guyat, the historian, yesterday went on a tear on Twitter, sort of taking it apart uh, in historical terms, accusing Gove of having a thin acquaintance with, with the history that he's invoking. And then our very own Chris Cook in today's sense maker um, basically is, is saying it's misleading on the numbers because if you, if you, if you update the, the scale of the spending on FDR's New Deal into today's dollars, it's a very large number compared with the very small, the relatively small numbers that, that Johnson is talking about in his boost for schools and other bits of uh, infrastructure investment uh, this week. Uh, not only are they, those um, relatively small numbers, but they're also existing um, planned spending just brought forward. But I mean, the point you made yesterday, actually, James, is, is interesting nonetheless, that if you take this reference to FDR, multiple references to FDR at face value, picked up by, so, so made in the speech on Saturday, picked up by, uh, sorry, uh, on Sunday, picked up by uh, Boris Johnson yesterday in his, in his interview with uh, Times Radio, Rooseveltian, then uh, you have a Tory government with, let us not forget, a big majority, a big belief in small government, we, we thought, uh, and in a broadly laissez-faire approach to, to, uh, to policy, and, and, you, and we can see a bit of that coming through in, in its, um, uh, let's say, relaxed approach to COVID, uh, suddenly hitching itself to the legacy of the, the biggest spender, the most unashamed interventionist in American history. Uh, and I think uh, and that's, so, so, so that's the reason, Charles, it, it's often fun, and I know that there's a fair amount of journalism in the last 48 hours that has, has picked apart the Michael Gove speech. But actually, it, it seems to me as though it's more remarkable if you take it at face value, right? And the idea that what many people perceived as a conservative government that was Brexit by conviction in that it believes in a smaller state, greater room for the market, uh, the power of enterprise. Just the, the thing that really struck me with these two paragraphs, Giles, uh, and, uh, and I'm just going to read them to everyone. Um, I'm sure I won't read them as well as uh, Michael Gove did. But he, he, paragraphs 41 and 42 are quite extraordinary in terms of what they're saying a conservative government is now about. And they're, they're invoking, if you like, the, the patron saint of American progressive politics, uh, Democrat politics, uh, FDR. Uh, and Michael Gove writes, first, Roosevelt took it as a given that no society could succeed unless every citizen within it had the chance to succeed. Throughout his political career, he had been concerned by the plight of the poor and the vulnerable, and he knew they needed government on their side if they were to achieve the dignity, status, and independence they aspired to. Reform was needed, he argued, quote, that builds from the bottom up, bottom up and not from the top down, that puts faith once more in the forgotten man at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Paragraph 42. There are too many in our time, this is Michael Gove writing, there are too many in our time and our society whose economic interests and whose values have been forgotten. In our unequal times, we must attend increasingly to those who have suffered from neglect and condescension, and also to those whose lives have been scarred by racism and prejudice. Our contemporary work of reform must put them first, put them first. It's quite a, if you think about, the platform on which they campaigned. Um, <laughs> I see someone's writing, Chris, this all fails the knock test, as in, you know, if you, do, if you said the opposite, would it mean anything? Well, well, it does mean something, doesn't it, Giles, in that you are reorienting what you're saying are your priorities in, in government, and you are invoking FDR and the power of government to fix them, not the power of uh, markets, not the power of enterprise. There is... Am I, do you think I'm reading too much into that? Well, let's, let's remember that, that this is, apart from anything else, crisis management. Yeah. Um, so, conversations in, in Downing Street, as they all remember 
you know, events, dear boy, mm. right? They've been hit in the solar plexus with the biggest event since the war. And so you're inevitably going to cast your net wide for um, historical analogies. And so um, <clears throat> to that extent, uh, this has to be more um, a, a big reach for a, uh, a historical justification for big spending and big intervention that has been sort of endorsed by history rather than necessarily a Damascene conversion yeah. on, on the part of two Tory ideologues. But, but I mean, uh, I don't think you're reading too much into it in that, uh, in that whatever they do now uh, with, with these kinds of rationales is going, may well define the next five years, 10 years of British politics could define their legacies. Um, I, guess, I, I guess what I, you know, I did this, one of the editor's voicemails did a couple of weeks ago was this argument that, that the UK was moving right internationally, i.e. it was falling in step with Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo on China, but it was moving less left domestically, that it is much more state spending, government programmes, and it's given itself an intellectual framework, even a historic one now. Um, I just I think it's always worth noting these things because people can be skeptical of them in the moment. I think it's also quite powerful to be skeptical of them over time, right? Mm. Uh, in that you can then measure what they're doing against what they said they were going to try and do. Um, other people, who's who's I see that um, uh, a number of people, not least Chris. Do you want to weigh in, Chris? Because I see that you think. So. So I, I mean, I, I come to this with some baggage because I used to have to cover Michael Gove when he was the education secretary. And um, we used to have this endless problem that he would give speeches that are quite boring about say, um, um, we're gonna change the criteria on which schools can become academies, right? Some stuff like that. And these things were progressively announced. And he would always have some like, uh, like Gramsci was one of his old favorites. And people would go away and write up, like, oh, you know, this in a in a speech which evoked da 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 da. da. And the, the thing you have to get to is you have to ignore all of that. There's no, this isn't, this is a, um, it's like a debater's parlor trick. They, he's just pretending to be interested in this stuff. I don't think any of it is real. I don't think any of it is intended to be real. It's just intended for people like you, James, to have <laughs> conversations about. How, what we can learn from FDR. Like, it's just distraction. That's, no, no, that, but, but hold on, Chris. My argument is not about what we learn from FDR. Mine is, I, I understood, right? So when I read Dominic Cummins' blog after 2016 and Brexit, I understood, uh, I felt like I really understood the argument that Dom Cummings and people like Dominic Raab were making. And it was, free us of the shackles of bureaucracy, free us of, the, uh, of a bloated government, allow a smaller state to be nimble and agile and unleash the animal spirits of enterprise that will increase prosperity. And we will then too spread the benefits of that prosperity across society. Britain will be a better country for it. That is a very, very different government from one that says, actually both the prime minister and in effect his number two are invoking FDR and saying, we're gonna marshal government and use big government programs to try and address problems and our biggest concern post-covid is an awareness of the inequalities and not just economic ones economic inequalities based on race that's quite a big difference i think, so. I think there are several there are several ways Things wrong yeah about what i'm saying yeah <laughs> i think the first thing is the thing that actually links the sort of cummings johnson agenda is actually um a hatred of of alternate sources of power, right? So Gove's, uh, Gove and Cummings have a, an experience of the EU in the early 2010s when they discovered that, for example, you can't just give Toby Young money to go around schools, you have to have a process. And the, um, they really came to hate all of the procurement stuff in particular. They hated the Department for Transport, was one of their weird fights, because right. the Department for Transport kept insisting that when you built a new school, you should, um, you should actually plan, you should actually have to tell people what it's going to do to the local traffic plans. And they, one of the things that, that links them and unites them, and one of the common themes for everything, is they really dislike alternate sources of power that will get in their way, whether that's the EU. If you look at the list of things that, Gum that Cummings 
praises in that blog. None of them are Democrats, right? They're all scientists or military figures or administrators in things like NASA. There's no democratically elected politician in the middle of this who has to sort of deal with compromise and everything else. And I think that's the thread that runs through all of these things. Actually, the, the thing they're talking about in this is massive centralization, right? This is what this, the lots of what they've, they've been doing and talking about for the last 10 years is about centralizing things to Whitehall so they can get rid of alternative sources of power. And the, I think that's the thread that leads. That's the thing you can see in FDR that they might like. I mean, to massive fights to the Supreme Court because they, they're worried he was taking too much power. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can bring in, I hope that um, I can bring in Lucy um, Huberman, because I've just texted her in the chat as you were speaking, Chris, because she, she'd she made this good point. Hello, Lucy. You made this good point, this choice that was in the chat, which was a, to exactly Chris's point, that this is about centralization. The reason it seems interesting to me, Lucy, is if you actually read Michael Gove's speech, there's a big chunk of it, which is we need to distribute power out of London. We need to get different people in. Chris is, <laughs> Chris is digitally shrugging at a distance. So Lucy, what's your read on it? I haven't read his speech, but I've been watching Boris Johnson for about 45 minutes out of an hour and a half of his speech this morning. That's, so, that is public service itself, thank you. <laughs> but I've only watched the first half, and the, the hilarious part was on the Guardian website for about 20 minutes before he comes in, everybody's mics on, and you can hear all the chatter about, is he going to arrive on a forklift truck? Is he going to arrive, you know, how is he going to arrive? Um, I don't think these are either ors, really. I think um, they do want to get rid of certain um, areas of bureaucracy, especially in procurement, but that doesn't necessarily spell out good things for the type of procurement they want to do. I mean, it's it's not, you know, it's, it, they've also said that, um, or people in their midst have said some of the reforms in the NHS um, are good, but they want to hand more into the private sector. So... I don't think, you know, I'd, the to make the mechanisms better is fine, but you have to look at, at, at to what end. And I, I think the other thing that they're keen on, apart from some decentralization, is control. I think they want both in, in different areas. This new biosecurity thing they've set up, which is now taking decisions about uh, COVID and the press conferences have stopped. How much do we know about that? There's no public press conferences anymore. There's a new biosecurity outfit. Yeah. Well, I, well, it's it's. I'm I'm going to bring a couple of other people in because um, I'm. I realise that this open news meeting on a Tuesday, amongst other things, is supposed to um, also flag up to us stories that we should be covering that we may be missing, and I'm aware that. Uh, Chris is there smiling at me saying, look, you've fallen directly into the government's trap of not just thinking too much about this, but wasting time when we could be talking about probably stories and subjects that might matter more. So if people have got those, steer me away. But I'm going to pick up two or three, indulge me, Chris, two or three thoughts. Uh, my colleague Kerry Thomas uh, had his hand up. I noticed that um, uh, Gertosh Sandu, Gertosh has made a point, there's not much money going in um, to, uh, into, frankly, into uh, the New Deal anyway. And I was quite interested to pick up Alice Hodkinson's point, which is that the Tories are supposedly pushing elected mayors and greater metro power. So firstly, Kerry, are you there? I'm here. Um, yeah. Let me sort of unfriendly way attack you from a slightly different direction than the one Chris is <laughs> attacking you from. So, so I think it's interesting, but I don't think it's surprising because I think in your analysis where you leap from the Dominic Cummings blog four years yeah. ago to now, the only thing you're missing out is the 2019 general election where it seemed to be, it was perfectly obvious that they were tilting. You know, we talked a lot at the time about how, how do the Tories manage to keep both Guildford and Mansfield? Mm -hmm. And the obvious answer is you have to tilt towards Mansfield because, and, and if you're going to keep winning Mansfield and all those red wall seats, then the answer is you have to, you have to spend more. And, and we knew that at the time, that, that, was, that was the platform that they won on. So I think the, the only bit I disagree with you about now is I think it's, it's wrong to be surprised now that they're saying it out again. But then what's up, but then Kerry, then just talk it through. So if you, if you go back to, for example, we're talking about just over six months ago now, where one of the central arguments around the Corbyn McDonnell manifesto was that you were talking about a world where public spending would move 
away from US levels towards German levels, right? And what you're essentially saying is that that's not the Corbyn McDonald manifesto now, actually that's the direction of travel in a Johnson Sunak government, right? So what happens, th these, things, these things creep up on us, but the signals are there that we are talking about a different deal on expenditure, a different deal then potentially on either tax or debt. Something different is going to happen in the 2020s from the bill of goods we got sold in December 2019. Isn't that true? Or do you think it was yeah. clear? No, I think you're, uh, that's true. And I, and I think um, there does still seem to be a, an unresolved tension within government between Prime Minister and Chancellor about, um, about how this is funded and how far it goes. So I think that, that's why I think it's interesting, because there is still a, a, a very live and unresolved argument there. But, but I guess, um, I think in the public mind, in order to, to score the, the victory and the scale of victory that the Tories scored in, in 2019, I think that this will be no surprise at all that they were expect that the promises that won the election for the Tories were to do with spending more. They were, you know, they were much, much more limited than the Corbyn McDonnell suite of offers, which was, you know, enormous. But they were certainly there. I just, I, I tell you, there's, a, there's an element of this too where. I'm interested because I think they, I think these guys will believe their own rhetoric, even if Chris doesn't, or even if others, you know, here think, not, and they will begin to think about FDR and the New Deal as a motif of government, and then they'll start doing things in that spirit. And I, you, you, Kerry, um, other people on the call, Kerry and I have been doing a series of effectively think-ins with the CBI, the Confederation on British Industry. We do these morning. Uh, uh, open webinars and we had Ed Miliband in last week or the week before last sorry and it was really striking that one of the things he was really interested in was um, a program run by FDR which recruited millions of people across the US to go out and build and in that case plant trees the conservation core right this was an FDR idea and now Ed Miliband back in the business brief for Labour and thinking about the environment too was well could you create a conservancy core in the UK for hundreds of thousands possibly millions of young people and so that's why I think the FDR thing is interesting is it's currently in the water amongst politicians yeah. but, I think, of it. but I think as well it's if you read the speech and I read it over the weekend I think it's it's as much a cultural appeal to the idea about the idea of the forgotten man as it is an economic appeal and, and so it's it, it's trying to ride that cultural and identity moment that brought the dinner you know, that was a large part of the Tory success back back last year as well. Um, Kerry thanks I'm going to just bring in Gertish because you've got as you just texted me is you've got to read this out because it does make quite a good point and also puts you squarely in the Chris Cook camp of <laughs> readers of small print that uh, <laughs> expose the silliness of people who buy into big ideas. So go as far away. This is just from an article that was done on Market Watch, which basically looks at the commitment to expenditure connected to, to the New Deal. And um, one of the quotes is, in other words, the few billions were already part of the UK's planned budget and the projects were already in the pipeline. In any case, the New Deal announced by Johnson amounts to 0.2% of the country's gross domestic product, barely an accounting error in the current recession. Yeah, and that, uh, I mean, as well, as well as actually also showing that the New Deal is the old deal, it does also raise this bigger question of whether or not at every step, Rishi Sunak, although seen as the new, new thing in the Treasury, has, has been too little and not long enough in terms of economic support. It's, I think it's a, it's a great point. Good, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I did ask just to see, I don't know, Alice Hodkinson, whether you want to just come in uh, on this subject, particularly on the... Hello there. there you Hello, are. I'm not sure what you want me to say. I well, just made some I comments. I was very excited because I thought you were going to talk about devolution and Doncaster and the things, and there you are, obviously, stuck on some <laughs> desert island, having to get a different <laughs> life. But, but, but it was, I didn't know whether or not you were in, if you like, my camp, the camp that we were called the suckers, uh, where where people think, oh, actually, there is something to devolution and there is something to the empowerment of metro mayors. And if it may not be as good as the rhetoric, 
it's a good direction of travel. That, that was the, that was the piece. In the I chat. think it's phony. I think it's phony. I think um, I don't think very many people are um, that interested in their local elected mayor. Um, it just seems like another way. Um, so I live between Cambridge and North Wales. Um, I don't think we've got them in North Wales, but we've got a, a, a mayor in um, in the Cambridgeshire area. And it, I mean, he's another elected politician. Don't we need somebody who can actually run something as opposed to being a figurehead? I, I, I just feel that it's, 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 it's not particularly useful. Right. Um, well, that, yeah, that, well, that's been, that, that's been one of the most interesting things, I think, by, of us by comparison with the states, where you do actually look at the power of state governors and you do realise that what we've got is nothing, nothing, nothing like that. Uh, Alice, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to do two things, and then I promise to move on, Chris, to something that's actually happening. Um, I'm going to bring in Jack Kessler, who's a colleague of ours and actually used to work in the Treasury. And then, Chris, I'm going to come back to you because I do just want to try and work out if the government says it's not doing austerity, but it is taking on this level of debt and spending. What the 2020s now looks like for the Treasury, Jack. Uh, hi James, um, I just hi. wanted to make a point um, to, to Kerry's point really, I put a little bit in the chat but it was just about, there was a really interesting report by um, UK and a changing Europe this week and there's a brilliant graph, I can share a link to it in the chat which shows the gap between the economic values of Conservative voters and that of Conservative MPs and it just made me think that even if the sort of the centre which is incredibly keen on on, on accumulating power and potentially doing something big on spending or actually when you look at the figures not but actually when you look at the economic views of Tory MPs um, there's quite a gap between them and their voters and therefore whether that creates problems soon or down the line in terms of big spending promises or additional borrowing that Tory backbenchers simply don't want to support. So, so sorry, Jack. Your, your point is that actually this is in the bones of the. It, this is not a government issue. This is a through the whole party. I, I just think that if, even if um, Sunak and Cummings and Johnson wanted to be as ambitious as FDR was in the 1930s, yes. they would come into the reality of the fact that they have a lot of backbenchers who think, well, that's not exactly what I came into into politics for, yeah, and that majority of 80 starts to look a bit shaky. Yeah, okay, that's really interesting. Jack, and where's, Chris, Chris, will you just give us a, I know this is a possible question, but how, did, how is everything going to get paid for if you don't start cutting spending or increasing taxes? We'll just borrow it. That's fine. We'll be, and that's it? That's fine. Like, we can do this. We can do this. It's, um, I think the... Um, and, what, and what's the long term, what's the 2025 to 2030 consequence of having five years of much higher borrowing well, we'll have more borrowing like it, it's sort of it's okay like you know we'll um um we'll either have a bit of inflation or you know or we'll just pay a bit more in tax you know it's it's sort of we print our own currency like there's a real limit to how bad it can get um and the i think the um i, I see sam is saying mmt it is not we are not going to have mmt um but the um the um, I think the, I think there's a danger of overthinking this, right? So that we've had 10 years where the state has been asset sweated, right? Mm. Really, really intensively. We need to put on half a million school places and secondary schools in the next few years. We have a healthcare system where we've, we've basically not allowed it to grow in relation in, you know, um, in line with the increased demand. Um, we've got, we've flogged off loads of capital, assets to make you know to to, to um raise funds for for other things so we've we've lost loads of if you like organic capacity in the state just room and stuff we might have to start building buildings bigger because of the virus we might have to start resilience from here on in will probably mean that we need more space per capita for things mm -hmm. um so all in all it feels like you don't have it's not like a right wing or left wing thing to sort of think we're just gonna have to spend a lot more money in the medium term and actually, the, the truth of it is, we've kind of we kind of already agreed to spend that money. So, um, when you don't update, when you stop paying for maintenance in a hospital in two thousand and five, and you flatter the deficit that way, which is what we did, mm. you haven't really cut the deficit. What's going to happen is we're going to have to spend that money. We're going to have to repair that roof, and then it'll appear later. Oh, I see. 
like the the a lot of this stuff is money that we just have to spend and we're going to that's one of the reasons why the announcement today is so antagonizing is because if you announce one and a half what well, like one billion pounds yes uh, uh, for the for the education system when you need half a million places or one and a half billion for the health service when you have a six billion pound critical deficit on uh, backlog on maintenance like this isn't the new deal this is literally mending the roof <laughs> yes and, and 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 i still have this i do have this thing which is that if you look at what was made available as guarantees to the corporate sector to the business sector right through those coronavirus business interruption loan schemes right 330 billion pounds worth of guarantees of which i think one tenth has been used in that siebel scheme you, you realize you have capacity or the government envisaged, the treasury envisaged capacity. Now I appreciate those were loans, they were guarantees, they were only 80% shouldered by the government. But you do think to yourself, hang on a second, you have capacity to be doing things, to be doing things differently. Um, all right, I, I think maybe Chris, we should, we, we should probably have a go at some point that gets away from the rhetoric look at you they see no good deed goes unpunished chris we'll, we'll 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 get away from the rhetoric but get into the small print and the reality on the uh, on the economy and particularly on the the government's tax spend and borrowing plans got to now, yes, go false argument for the last few years about debt that's one of the big things right so so you the way that gov governments are like states are unusual in that they are continuously growing in yes. you know GDP since the Industrial Revolution, since we escaped the Malthusian trap, the state has been continuously growing its income, and that means that we can just borrow quite a lot of money, and it kind of doesn't matter. Like we yes. can. Uh, I, get, I, I understand that, Chris. I guess what I'm trying to say is just, or maybe articulate probably badly, is just the extent to which I find myself confused, amazingly confused by the world. If you go back to the politics of 2008, 9, 10. Right. The conservative claim on government was, was about debt. Yeah. All, all of it was around the Labour had run the country into the red, right? And, and the, the red, the red, the red. That was always the, the framing of it. And now we've got a conservative government too that is going to debt finance the future. Also, we just had a rethink, major rethink. But I think that's, I think it's... Um... When you have a so in back in two thousand eight nine ten we thought we had deficit fiscal deficits of eleven percent of income right yes the sort of genuine even I who am quite sanguine about debt would be quite worried about an eleven percent deficit but the we now have one that's like one and a half percent right like you should be having a different pro you should have a different approach to it yes you know we should be be basically a stat the, the British government should be aiming for like a deficit in the long term on average of about two and a half three percent that's completely sustainable there's less than the growth rate of the economy on that trajectory the amount of debt actually comes down um over the long term you know that's fine that's you know that's where we should be um that's a sort of normal what, what, what number chris, chris just said it again you want the you want the the deficit to be basically less than the nominal growth rate of the economy okay income is going up by three percent every year you can you're, you're have percent more every year and it you know you the repayments stay the same and so that's Think of it. Okay, so you want a deficit, you want to be spending more than you're getting in, and that number, that deficit, to be growing by a little bit you less the than the growth of the economy. Right. Yeah. So, and the, 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 the economy usually grows, we get, say, 2% inflation and 2% growth, about 4%. So you want to be having a deficit of less than 4%. And if you do that, the debt burden, even as you borrow more each year, the debt burden will fall. And that's kind of a, a nice place to be. That's where we usually end up parked. Right. And, that's, and so that means that you basically take on the additional borrowing in a crisis like COVID and say that rebases things, but we will, but we can take a 10 year trajectory. Got it. Okay. All right. Listen, I'm going to, I'm going to reorient things if I might, because there are a few other stories on the news list. One of them, I, I really don't understand, but I have strong feelings about, and it's masks and the politics of um, face masks. And I can't remember uh, who it was exactly who said that the face mask is, mask is going to be a sort of new badge in the culture war. And I saw Anthony Fauci over night worrying about the level of anti-vaxxers and refusal to, to vaccinate. And I imagine there's something similar uh, in masks. I'm just, 
I'm just interested about the extent to which this feels like a particularly US issue, people saying that they won't wear masks as a statement about requirements from government, individual liberty, um, or whether or not people here think actually they're quite struck by how, as the government would, I think, have us believe, courteous, compliant, use the word that you like, on uh, face masks. Is anyone strongly interested in this subject? Right, they don't protect the wearer. No, I see. Alice has just made a point. They don't protect the wearer. Okay, Giles, I'm going to bring you back in. Giles is into face masks. Uh, only because uh, uh, four-fifths of my immediate family are American, uh, and we were talking to a similar family. Is I, forgive me, some tortoise people have heard this, but I gather, not having been able to go to the States uh, for a year, that it, the wearing of a mask has become as much of a political statement uh, as, as the non-wearing of a mask. We've paid a lot of attention to largely uh, Trump-supporting crowds defiantly not wearing masks in demonstrations uh, broadcast on, on the news. But um, in uh, uh, towns that I know well, I'm told that to put one on is, is, is like walking around with, I'm a Democrat and I hate Trump on your forehead. Um, uh, any, any notion that uh, it is for public health reasons, or, and more specifically for other people, not yourself, which is the main, it, it, is, it yeah. is an act of simple politeness to wear a mask, because as we know, it, it, its main purpose, if you happen to be contagious, is, is to protect others rather than yourself from, from their viral load, uh, is out the window. I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that where I live in London, a lot of people don't wear them, but nobody gives me the hairy eyeball for wearing one. Um, so we're not there yet. It, it's not part of our culture, but as far as I can tell, it, it, it definitely is in the States. And sorry, my, my, my sample size is small there. It's one town in Massachusetts and one town in South Carolina, but exactly the same story told by um, democratic leaning people um, uh, who have chosen to wear masks in, in their view for public health reasons but they, they, they're seeing it taken as a political signal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in, if I might, because there's an element here about masks, which I hadn't heard, but Jake Oakes makes, saying that it's going to have an impact on loneliness and on communication with people. I think, Jake, are you, Jake, saying that you're deaf and that, that, that it really impacts the way in which you can communicate with people. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I get the whole kind of health element on how important that is, but... If, for example, I'm just going to the shops and things and people are wearing masks, I can't communicate with the with the person behind us selling the newspaper. And that kind of really has quite a big impact because it feels like I no longer belong to the community that I'm in. And I think that's going to be a real challenge going forward. Those big masks that are kind of see-through, much easier. Yes, um, much. much easier, but it's that kind of element of we need to consider all the aspects of health yeah. and masks don't really the kind of the emphasis on focusing on just mass as a solution doesn't doesn't consider our mental health, you know, older people not being able to lip read. We all lip read 30% of the time anyway. Yes. Um, do, do, do we think, about Jake, them. is there anyone who's made clear whether or not the, the, the clear perspex or plastic mask is X percent as effective as the, as the paper mask? We just don't know. I don't know. No, I don't know. Oh, well, that's but and your point is not just not, not just in terms of communication amongst deaf people and between deaf people and um, and, and people out uh, out and about in shops and workplaces, but more broadly loneliness and a and a and a sort of communication problem. What, what, what do yeah. you mean by that? That just people won't connect as much with people. I think so. I think it represents a barrier, doesn't it? Um, I yeah. think quite a lot of these things are representing a barrier between people who become scared of each other, and right. I think masks. And kind of add to that, um, add to that, add to that fear factor. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so th thank you very much. I'm going to bring in. There was also just an interesting point, which um, I just wanted to see if I could bring in Rachel, uh, if I can, because Rachel Bentley had said that she had been on the tube. I imagine it was. I don't know Rachel whether you were in London on public transport, but you said that lots of people were wearing the masks, but then wearing them wrong. 
Yeah, so I would say I, I went on the tube for the first time last week and I was a bit nervous um, and I had my kind of homemade mask on. And I would say probably about 95% of people were wearing some kind of face covering. Um, but of that 95%, probably, you know, 80% had them covering their nose and mouth. But, you know, you had the people who had them on their chin. You had the people who had them covering their mouth, but not the nose. And I just think, you know, we're spending so much money on things right now. Could we not have a public health message that says, you need to cover your mouth and your nose. You know, you take them off correctly, you put them on correctly. Um, it's still about not touching the face. Um, I just think we have got this really half, can I say the word asked? Half-assed approach to, to mask wearing in this country. And I think we need to, to take some lessons from um, Asian countries in particular about the use of them and I heard something especially this weekend around our higher education sector we're not going to be able to attract Asian students back into the UK if we're not taking mask wearing seriously and I, I say that as somebody who lived in Japan for nine years. R Rachel thank you there's there's um I, I'm interested uh, Alice Hopkinson actually helpfully says that these clear visors don't stop so much of the droplet aerosol spray so you need a mask over the nose and, and mouth alice thank you um i do want to though see if i can bring in claire montague um claire are you there yep yep far away uh so i suppose i have two points really one about the culture wars well they're both interrelated so i work in healthcare i'm not a doctor like um alice but i felt very strongly particularly during the early parts of the crisis when we were un unable to access surgical masks about people walking around wearing them and wearing them badly. And basically to Rachel's point, that the sort of moving around your mask and playing with it is a totally sort of counterproductive. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think the other point that is interesting, James, what you were saying about the culture wars and the culture wars in the States, I think there is such a lack of clarity within this country about when you use masks and under what circumstances. Yeah. Um, clearly there are public transport, it's now become mandatory, but it's very unclear in shops, for example, whether you should wear a mask and whether you shouldn't wear a mask. You know, if you can maintain distance, but what time if you sort of wander around the aisles? And I think it becomes very difficult to engender a kind of rallying cry around where, what, what kind of public health adherent you are when it's not entirely clear what it is you're supposed to do. And the other thing is that masks, for those of them who wear them, and Alice will know, we now have to wear them full time at work. Those right. people, and they are awful. They are so hot and they are so uncomfortable. And it's a very hard thing to ask people to continue to wear when it's not very clear what the benefits of them are or what, what circumstances you need to wear them in. And, and so, uh, so you, because I'm, honestly, Claire, I'm, I'm really unclear. Um, the, the, I totally see Rachel's point, and I appreciate that, you know, in Japan and increasingly China too, actually, it's just a much more of a culture of wearing masks, and so they'll have a knock-on of who comes as students. But is your frustration that people are not wearing them properly, or that even if you are wearing them, it's unclear what the benefit is? It's a bit, it's, to be honest, it's a bit of both. I mean, there is, that for a long time during the start of the pandemic, they were very unclear about the benefit of wearing masks outside of healthcare settings. And it's now clear that there appears to be some benefit in having a barrier between you as the wearer. So it doesn't protect you, the wearer, but it protects other people from your droplets yeah. but the problem is if you are then if you're going to do that you need to maintain a constant barrier and then you need to get rid of your mask safely and doff it so that you're not then taking it off or messing it around and now you've got your virus all over your hands which you're now smearing everywhere else yeah. so it's both that it's not particularly clear the benefits you can sort of see them but actually they start getting negated if people use them badly yes and i think there's also something about full senses of security oh well it's fine i'm wearing my mask yeah. Whereas we know the biggest things that the things that are most important in the virus are washing your hands and maintaining a distance. Mm -hmm. And a mask should be only secondary if you can't maintain distance. And the risk is you chuck it on and you're not oh, fine. Well, um, I mean, um, can I just ask one thing? Well, we're just going to wind up the section on masks in one second, but I want to bring Alice Hodkinson back in. Just Alice, I'd love to hear your explanation of whether or not we really need these masks, whether or not the hand washing is actually probably more important what your judgment is and for other people who've got other thoughts on their mind and thinking we've only got 15 minutes less left and i really have something urgent that i want to bring to the table here uh, 
uh, either message me or message everyone and I'll make sure that we do exactly that. Uh, but Alice, do you want to just let us know what the, what your view is? Yeah, well, um, I was really anti-masks to begin with um, because um, we've known within, um, uh, well, you know, actually we don't wear them particularly and in theatre, in, in surgery, actually masks haven't been shown to be much benefit for the, the surgeon, only in, only in very few circumstances. Um, and so when we were all being, right at the start, we weren't wearing masks to begin with, but actually that could be when uh, all of us workers might have had the infection and we may have been spreading it around without, without knowing. Mm -hmm. So now we're all wearing um, surgical masks and yes, they're difficult to wear, but actually I have been getting used to it. Um, they steam up my glasses rather. Um, and, um, but it, it's, the, it's the barriers to communication and I feel really quite sorry for the, um, uh, vulnerable patients who are having to wear these masks yeah. um, and all that. I'm not sure how much of a benefit they are, but I think from a pragmatic point of view, if mask wearing means that we can get back to some kind of um, normality, then I think that's the way we have to go. And it, it, um, But I don't, um, I think we've just got to be really cautious because um, if people are taking their masks off when they're outside and putting them on when they're inside, which it has a, a, some kind of logic to it, then as other people have said, that's going to be, you're going to get the, the virus on your hands. But on the other hand, you're getting your virus on your hands when you touch anything. Um, so we mustn't forget the hand washing and that's, um, um, it, it'll go all over your clothes, all over your bags. If there's somebody around who's, who's got the virus and is sneezing, then it'll be everywhere. Yeah. Um, I mean, you walk past somebody in the street and you can smell their cigarette smoke. Now I know, and you, you might be 10 meters away. Now I know that's um, a slightly different spread from um, the droplets, but you, do, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to be entirely isolated from the virus um, with, with, any, with any protection like that, and it, any distance. That's fine. Uh, Alice, thank you uh, on that. Uh, as I said, please do, please do weigh in if there are things that you want particularly for us to talk about or look at. I wanted to just, if I could just spend a couple of minutes talking about two elements of our journalism in the last week that are different. Um, as you can imagine, if you start a new news business and we launched just over a year ago, you're not going to in your first year be the finished article. Uh, I'm not sure a journalistic endeavour is ever the finished article, but there are two things that, are, that we've tried to do and are, are still working on doing really differently. One is this thing I said at the beginning about being open so it was a big deal for us in that Alexi Mostras, one of my fellow editors, has been spending months looking at the royal family's finances. And we held a news meeting on that subject last Wednesday to try and hear different points of view before we published this week. If you've had the chance to look at it, I think it's an incredibly interesting piece, not just in the headline terms about how much the uh, taxpayer funding to the royal family has increased over the last decade, how much it potentially will increase further if future wind farms come online. Um, but also there's something about the cautious kid glove, uh, some might even say craven way in which politicians deal with the royal household on money that is really surprising and, and I think quite revealing. And it feels as though this is one of those tidal subjects where the tide goes out and then the tide comes back in and it feels as though it is coming back in so you know I'd be really interested to hear what people have thought about that and where that that might go next but I also just wanted to flag up one other thing which is on our news list today we held a think in last uh, summer in June with Richard Curtis and a group of other people talking about at that time it was called um, be proud of your pension it was the beginnings of a uh, campaigning effort to make people aware of the money that is held in their names and is then invested, whether it's in tobacco companies or oil and gas companies or, or other parts of the economy that they might have a view on. And today it launches formally, it's called Make My Money Matter. In fact, almost exactly now, I think, uh, Richard Curtis and the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, are doing that, are engaged in that launch. And it's significant for us because one of the cardinal rules of journalism, at least when I was growing up, was you reported the story and you left others 
to take an interest in what happens next. And one of the things we're trying to do at Tortoise is say, no, no, we inevitably in our choice of issues, in our choice of stories and journalism, take an interest in what happens next. And we've had an increasing focus on how do you actually marshal the money that's in markets, in, in, in investment and pension funds to change um, real world outcomes. And so I just A, wanted to flag up, make my money matter. Um, uh, I think it's now called Pensions with Intention, which is, as Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. So, so I hope people will take a look at it, but it's been a recurrent subject for us. And it's a big area of focus for my colleague, Alexandra Musavizadeh on the responsibility um, 100 index and the responsible business forum so please do let us know uh what you think of it i'm now just picking up uh if there's anything else i've missed oh hang on there's linda arch who's i think on the i've um missed i don't know linda whether you want to come in on this question about who advice um and i see someone is saying that we should be looking more deeply at Labour, Starmer and how they uh, how they respond. Um, yeah, Linda, are you there? Oh, we're waiting for a video. While we do, I'm going to go go back, if I might, then to Nico McDonald, because Nico has had his hand up patiently. Hi, Nico, there you are. Hello. Hi there. Uh, just briefly on the theme you were discussing just now, I'd love to see news organisations find a way to thread a story indefinitely into the future to tell us what happened, you know, not just stories they're interested in, but, you know, what's happening in Libya now? I know that's back in the news, but, you know, all the things that we were preoccupied about one, two, three, five years ago that drop out of the news. Um, but my, my point was about the Prime Minister's speech. So he talks about creating a new science funding agency presumably related to DARPA, one of the uh, undemocratically accountable agencies we've been talking about, yes. um, to back higher risk, high reward projects. And the chasm between invention and application, that means brilliant British discoveries has appeared to California and China. Um, and I'd be interested to know, I didn't see anything in the speech really reflecting on why, or, you know, this new agency might solve the few hundred year old problem, arguably, that we have in the UK of being good at science and invention, but not great at innovation. And I've posted something on LinkedIn, which is, I hope, constructively critical about the failures, I think, of Innovate UK and the catapults, um, catapults which try and address different aspects of this. But um, I would be interested, well, what should we say? I value people's feedback on this, but I think we're not probably enge properly engaging with the challenges of innovation in the UK, which I think are more than technical or funding. I think they're at a social, cultural and, and political level. You know, for instance, risk aversion being one mm -hmm. of them and a lack of leadership in the UK to actually celebrate invention and economic growth. Although Johnson is better than that than any previous prime minister in recent years. Uh, and this is the reason, Nicola, why I, I, I perhaps I'm, I fall foul of a certain naivety because I look at the things in the Gove speech, for example, and one of them is how do you change the how, how do you change the UK record on innovation, particularly around the people that you've got in government, who they give contracts to, who they don't, how the you know the deck is stacked against the innovators in that in that sense. Um, but you know, as you say, so it's a question of whether or not there is there there really is a a willingness to to make those changes in in who runs those processes and 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 who actually gets gets chosen for them. Yeah. But I just wonder, are you talking also about scaling up about the capacity of UK innovators or inventors to scale up what they do in business terms? Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. And this is you know Sherry Kutu among other people's yeah. theme. And, you know, I've seen in the digital industries that I've been involved in for 25 years that we started a lot of really great companies that then get bought out, you know, SwiftKey got bought out by Microsoft, which was a great, you know, uh, technology company and, you know, happened, I mean, Arm is the biggest, I guess, in the last few years was bought out by SoftBank. Um, so, yes, scale up is certainly the issue, you know, and, and you know, it's a completely unoriginal. People ask why there's no 
British Google, I, I think that's a slightly facile question because we should be doing the next thing. We should be inventing a search engine for ideas and knowledge, not information or something meta. Uh, but yes, I'm talking about scaling up. And also just this terrible risk aversion in, in UK government. Everything has to be justified and the level playing field and the box is ticked in order to fund anything. And that means there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of admin, and that favors the big companies, the safe bets. No one ever got criticized for you know, involving BT in a funding project, et cetera. Uh, and it means that small companies where innovation is what they do and form filling is not what they do are not, uh, you know, not, you know, don't get in the door in the end of the day. No. And I think we need to have people championing innovation who are trusted to not be biased, to fund great projects and support them. And, you know, not to have to tick a million boxes in order to do that. Yeah. And, you know, I'd love to see a review of, you know, Innovate UK over the last 10 or 15 years and see actually how successful it's been. So, so uh, again, I'm going to sound like I'm a shill for Michael Gove's ideas. His, one of his big things, <laughs> Nico, in this speech is we should be measuring the policies we introduce. Um, and his, I think he makes a point that of the 108 big government projects, only 8% are reviewed on outcomes. It's one of the points he makes and his, mm -hmm. and his argument is about this and to be fair to him he lists the introduction of the national citizen service the gangs task force a whole bunch of things that he was involved with and says someone should be out there measuring whether they're whether they're working so um i think that's right i do think that um uh Lucy Huberman's point. Lucy, just to let you know, yes, we are working with Independent Sage. In fact, Matt Dancona is involved with them, one of our fellow editors. So, yes, we're hoping to to try and pull something together with them and on that. Um, but um, yes, I agree too that we should be thinking about Nestor in this context. Um, I'm going to I'm going to wrap up by just giving you one sort of small update, which is we held the Tortoise's first education summit last Thursday. Um, it was amazing really for us, you know, when we started the year, we would often get, you know, sometimes 50, 60, maybe 100 people in our newsroom for a thinking. Uh, we were getting five, six hundred people for every single one through the course of the day on Thursday and, and over 2000 people joined. I think the big question that people have with these summits and even with, with more and more of these digital events is what concrete will come out of it. And so we're trying to pull together um, if you like, the beginnings of a tortoise view on what a revolution in learning looks like, not an institutional blueprint, but an outline of uh, ideas and concrete proposals that might make a difference to that. So we're going to try and pull that together in the course of this week and hope to bring that back uh, next week to discuss so that we can uh, produce something that we can keep coming back to and seeing whether or not real changes are happening. Um, Personally, I've been fascinated for a long time in adult education, lifelong learning. It was more than a little depressing to discover that we're actually moving so far backwards as a country rather than forward. So uh, I hope that we'll have something that we can work, uh, work on and discuss uh, in that context next week. Um, but for today, um, it's, uh, it's at least two o'clock in London. Um, a huge thank you to everyone for joining. I hope that's been a good uh, airing and sharing of what we're working on and some of the things that we think about. Uh, as you can see, not all the same, uh, but, but, but think about energetically. Th thanks for sparing the time. I hope everyone has a very good afternoon. All the best. Bye.